starting. Okay. Okay, gang. <laughs> well, everybody okay? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. It's all Christmas ball. Christmas ball. Yeah. Christmas ball. No. <laughs> yeah. You ready with all the feast? Okay. No? Ready for everybody to invade the house? No? All right. Well, a couple of things before we begin tonight. Um, remember our services this weekend. We got Saturday night, the 6th. You're going to be gone. Wow, playing hooky. Um, spiritual demerit, right? Yes. Um, Saturday night, 6 o'clock, and then Sunday, regular service schedule, 9 30, 11, 12 30, but we have a service at 6 p.m. on Sunday night. Okay? No service on Christmas Day. That's Monday. Or so, Monday. 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 Okay? Now, the following weekend Football. is New Year's Eve. Right? The 31st. We will not have a service that Saturday night, the 30th, but we will have our regular service schedule on New Year's Eve, the 31st, 9 30, 11, 12 30, and then what happens at 6 o'clock? Christmas, I mean, a New Year's concert. Okay? So 6 o'clock to 7 30. Make sure you're here, all right, for that. It'll be a communion service during the day. I'm going to do, you know, pass the whole plate to the entire church. Um, and Gary will be preaching that day. So um, be ready for that. Um, January is coming fast. Um, we will uh, kick off a brand new series on the first Sunday in January. It's going to be called A Life Fulfilled, <coughs> and Pastor Eric will kick that off. We'll probably go um, through January, part of February with that, and then um, we'll roll into our next series. In February, our City Serve project is going to be something called Heart and Soul. It is, we are asking our congregation to buy new t-shirts and sneakers for elementary age kids okay. um, and what we're going to do is give those to all those kids in those elementary schools that we've been helping out by the way that has gone great we we wrapped i think 2500 or 3000 yeah. gifts and uh the kids have been ecstatic in the schools not only that the the schools have been just the administrations have been great so it's been a good good time of, of celebration um, that's about it in terms of announcements, I think. A uh, couple of things um, that we need to pray for. Um, Pastor Eric is very sick. He's got the bug that everybody else has got. So pray for him because he's preaching all those services this weekend. And he needs... I, I know you don't think this would be the case, but preaching wears you out. Yeah. You, we get what we call, pastors, we call it the holy hangover. <laughs> and it, it just wears you out. Um, so pray for him that he is healthy and, and great for the weekend. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, Kathy's got a very important uh, doctor's appointment January 2nd. So let's keep her in prayer uh, for that. Uh, somebody in the room will go in un unnamed, has got some test results coming tomorrow. She's asked that we pray for that. Um, the other thing is my wife, my wife never gets sick, ever, 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 ever. And she is, she sounds like she's next to death's door. Mm. She is really, really sick. Um, so if you could pray for her tonight. The other thing is my oldest son is maybe taking a new job you know, he's a college football coach um, he's been he's been asked to join uh, the recruiting area in Mississippi State uh, which is a nice a nice little thing um, so he told him yesterday he's waiting for them to confirm back to him so if you could pray for that that would be great yeah so um, but those are the big things uh, I think that's going on in, in my life and some of your lives. Anything else we need to pray for? Yeah, I, I just 
Thanksgiving, uh, I had mm -hmm. my blood test a couple weeks ago and the results came in and my PSA was 0 0.1 and you're allowed up to 4. So I'm about as low as you can go. So that's good. That's great. Amen. Amen. The Lord is Amen. I don't know if anybody saw the news last night in the uh, chase we had in Pebble Point. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, John um, Cusack was the officer involved. He's a good friend of mine. And good news is he came home from the hospital today. Uh, didn't break any bones, tore some ligaments. Uh, so I think he's got both his legs are casted right now. Um, that car drug him about a half a mile. Mm -hmm. And he had a body camera on if you might see the news. But he lost that really. He went about another quarter to half a mile after that. So wow. fortunately, he's going to be okay. But uh, yeah. there's prayers for healing. Yeah. Amen. So um, a lot going on. Uh, this is Super Bowl week. <laughs> For a home church, you know, you think of it that way. If you are serving um, this weekend, especially in our first impressions area, our ushers, our greeters, um, our connect center, uh, our cafe, our parking team, our security team, we really need help this weekend. Um, we're going to be doing a candlelight service uh, on the weekend, so that means we need a lot more hands than we normally do. So if you can uh, work as many services as you can, we'd appreciate that a lot. Okay? So let's pray, and then we'll jump right into God's Word. Father, we, we approach you today with great expectation. Father, we, we rejoice in the privilege of worshiping the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who came to this earth as a babe, the one who created the world, and yet he descended upon the earth to experience everything that we've experienced and yet was without sin. And we rejoice in the privilege that you've given us to be your children. Father, we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. And we rejoice in the privilege of being able to call you that. Father, tonight we, we think of all these prayer requests, all the health needs, my wife, this, this police officer, the unspoken uh, request. We pray for Kathy tonight that you would continue to to heal her and touch her, uh, give her give her the wisdom that she needs. That doctor's appointment on the second. Um, we pray for Amy tonight. I know that Amy is won't won't say anything, but we we need to pray for her because of her shoulder. We pray that you would continue to heal her. Um, Lord, we're thankful that Ron got great news from all of his test results. Lord, we, we've been talking about you as being a God of miracles. And we see it time and time again. We've seen it in this group. We praise your name for it. And we ask that you just continue to be glorified through us. Father, tonight as we study your word, guide us, direct us, instruct us, that we might know you. And that we may only know you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, guess what? We're heading into chapter 9. Streaking on to another chapter. And as we've done every single chapter, we're going to go back and recount where we've been. You know, one of the things they teach you in school is repetition is good, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we learned our multiplication tables. You learned all that stuff. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to do this another 14 times because there's 22 chapters in Revelation so we're going to do it all the way through okay um, but let's summarize chapters 1 through 8 and remember chapter 1 is the purpose and the theme of the letter and it begins with that great promise that all who read in other words you actually read God's word all those who hear it in other words understand it and all those who heed in other words follow you will be blessed it starts with that great blessing, and it ends with that great blessing. And it's a great chapter to just get your head around to think that God promises a blessing if we just read and we understand and we heed his word. Boy, is that powerful. We could stop there and go home tonight. Right? Um, that's a sermon in and of itself. Now, chapter 2, all the way through chapter 3, describes what we call what will be and that's the whole chapters around the letters to the seven churches remember that and then we've got chapters four all the way through the end and it describes what is to come 
What will be happening in the future? What is God's final plan for mankind and his kingdom of the earth? So chapter 1 is kind of the preamble. It sets up everything. And then we begin chapters 2 through 3, and it talks about those seven churches. And it begins with Ephesus. And Ephesus was a great church. That church was doing everything. They, they were evangelizing. They were feeding the poor. They were following God's word. They were doing all these great things. And Jesus says, listen, don't lose your first love. They had become a little bit orthodox. They had become so legalistic that they were checking the box. And Jesus says, that's not the answer to your faith. A relationship with me, so don't lose your first love. Right? Great work for us as a church, right? Because in the tyranny of the urgent, you know, churches are, are like uh, many institutions. There, there is a cycle in a church, right? Sunday's always a coming, if you get my drift. We, we have to plan every single week for Sunday. We have to do something every single week. We plan months in advance. The grind can get you in church, right? You, you can become legalistic. You can lose focus of what our first love is, and that's a danger. And I think we can do that in our lives, too. So Jesus says, let's not fall into that trap. I think it's a good word for us. Then we have Smyrna. Remember Smyrna. Smyrna was, on, was one of only two churches that was not rebuked by Jesus in the letters. Smyrna was a church that thought itself to be poor and destitute and, and not really doing much. They were under intense persecution. And yet Jesus says, oh no, you are spiritually rich. It's a great commendation. This is a church that stood firm for Christ. They understood his word. They honored him. They followed his word. And despite the persecution, they stuck with it. And Jesus says, keep standing firm. What a great message for us as a church. All right? Now, we as Americans, I'm going to be honest with you, we really don't face persecution. Some of us think we do, but we really don't, right? We, we could learn from this church, because this church is a church that has been through something we really haven't been through. And so let's make sure that we stand firm for Christ. Then we come to the church at Pergamum. Now, Pergamum was a church that compromised with the world through false teaching. The, the implication is, or, or the scene is, is that there appears to be some kind of teaching that has infiltrated that church. And it's starting to get into the church and change its DNA. Right? And Jesus says, return to my word. Return to my word. I think this church is a great message for us as American evangelical Christians. Because there is a lot of stuff pounding at the door of the church today. There's a lot of methodology things that are pounding at the door of the church today that can divert our attention away from what is really true and good about God's word. And Christ says, don't fall into the trap. Don't fall into Christian pop psychology with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on. And that's happening in the church today. So um, I think... Pergamum is a great church for us to listen to. But then we come to the church of Thyatira. And you remember that the Greek implies that this church tolerated sin. Not only did they, they compromise with it, but they tolerated it. They, they compromised in terms of letting it stay. They never addressed it. And the Greek implies that the to toleration occurred at the very top of the church. In other words, the pastor's the pastors were allowing this to occur. So when the pastors allow it to occur, what happens to the flock? They follow. They follow. Right? And it's, it's a very dangerous thing. And so Christ comes to them and says, you've got to be steadfast in your commitment to me. Don't turn away from me. Stay true to me. Stay true to my teachings. Oh, leaders, don't fall into the trap of trying to fill the seats in the church by doing a lot of funky things. That's happening in American Christianity. <coughs> right? And I'm not saying church shouldn't be fun. 
Quite contrary, it should be. But let's be <coughs> careful what we're doing as leaders. Then we come to the church at Sardis. Now Sardis is an interesting church. This was a church that if you were to drive by, it was like a church on a four-way corner. The, the lawn was manicured impeccably. The bushes were trimmed just right. It had the greatest looking steeple. You know, the stained glass looked awesome. This church looked like it was great. And yet, Jesus says that you're actually dead. They had all the trappings of a church, but the message was not Jesus. It was everything else, but it wasn't Jesus. And so Jesus says to them, listen, you're, you're, you're dead. You're actually dead. You've got to do a 180 degree turn and come back to me. And so you see this progression from Pergamum to Thyatira to Sardis, right? Where you let the, the yeast get into the dough. And what happens? Those of you who bake, what happens with, when that happens? It, rises. it just rises. It gets into the whole loaf, right? And so that's kind of the picture that you've got here. Is that once sin infiltrates the church, it is, it is almost impossible to eradicate it if you're not dedicated to Christ. Mm -hmm. Then you come to Philadelphia. Now, this is the second church that was not condemned by Jesus. This was a faithful church in the midst of great persecution. They were persecuted, and yet they held firm to Jesus. And remember, I said last week that this church actually stayed around for 14 centuries. 14 centuries, right? Think, think about that. Could, could our church stay around 14 centuries? Mm -hmm. Praise God, right? You know this passage of the two churches that weren't rebuked were those that stood on the persecution? Yeah, they were the two churches that were, were solid with Christ. They stood even in the midst of great persecution. Persecution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you, you know, Philadelphia was a fabulous church. They stayed around for 14 centuries. And, and I, I, I didn't look at it. I don't know if Will looked at it. But I think the reason they eventually succumbed was because of the Muslim armies that came into that region and wiped them out. Right? But otherwise, they could have been still standing. It was a great church. And then we come to the church at Laodicea. Now, this church was in a church that was apostate. They were neither cold nor hot. Jesus says, I wish you were one or the other, but since you're neither, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Right? And the picture here is this church is just, there's nothing good about it at all. And Jesus is using imagery of the water supply into that region. The, the water supply into Laodicea was rancid. It was awful. And Jesus is saying, you people are just like the water you drink. You, you, I, I can't even stomach you. Right? And you remember, that's a great chapter, though, because Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If, if someone will open the door and let me come in and sup with him, I will restore you. And even in the midst of a church like Laodicea, Jesus wants restoration. He calls for restoration. He desires to have fellowship. It's a great picture of his mercy. It's a great picture of his love. Right? And yet, we have no indication that they open the door. It's a sad picture in some ways. But it's, it's a great lesson for us. So those seven churches are great things we can learn as a church, but it's a great thing for us to look at that our lives through the filter, those filters as well, right? Um, and so that kind of wraps up chapter 3. And then we come to chapter 4. And remember chapter 4 is this description. It's almost like chapter 4 is, is <coughs> like the prelude to what's about to come. You see the great picture of the throne room of God. Remember all of the inhabitants that, that are there. You remember what they're doing. They're all worshiping. Remember that? And then we come to chapter 5, and we see the second vision of Christ as the Lamb of God. 
And the picture is, Christ is seen as a lamb as if he had been what? Slain. 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 Right? And yet he's alive. Yeah. A visible picture of the resurrection of Christ. The lamb of God has come back to life. And so Christ is seen here in this chapter as the rightful owner of all of creation. And he will redeem the world from sin and rebellion and wickedness and evil. Amen. Amen. Let's go home. Right? <laughs> That's a good chapter. I like yeah. that chapter. But then we head into chapter 6. Mm. Chapter 6 is a tough chapter. And really, 6 and, and 7 and 8 and guess what? 9. 9 mm. is going to be a tough chapter. 9 is not a Christmassy type chapter. <laughs> Sorry. Right? But chapter 6 opens with this picture of the breaking of uh, seals 1 through 6. Remember, there are 7 seals. And these seals bring great destruction upon the world. Now, seals 1 through 4 are described as the birth pains by Jesus in Matthew 24. And you remember what happens there. There's this false sense in seal 1 of, of peace. And then seal 2 is broken, and there's great war upon the earth. And then comes great famine with seal 3. And then naturally what happens? Comes death, seal 4. So the first four seals sound like they're awful, but then it gets worse because seal five comes and you see this picture of the throne room of God and all the, the saints that have been martyred are under the throne and they are doing what? Praying. They're praying. And what are they praying for? Yes. They're praying for the end. They're saying, oh Lord, when are you going to come back? When are you going to deal with the evil? When are you going to take care of what needs to be taken care of? And what does Jesus say? A little longer. A little longer. Just wait a little longer. So the picture he, there and that, that seal is, yes, he's going to deal with it, but there's more difficulty to come. There are more martyrs to be slain. It's, it's a very difficult chapter to look at. And then you've got seal six. Remember seal six is the great shaking of the world and the cosmos, right? It's called the great day of the Lord. It's where all of the earth is shaken. Remember, people cry out, oh, may the mountains fall upon us, right? Now, if you read that, that section of chapter six, you notice that they don't cry out to God, oh, please save us. They say, oh, may the mountains fall upon us. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't come to Christ. It, it's, a, it's a difficult picture, right? So you have the six seals that are broken, and, and you think, man, it can't get much worse. But it can, right? And then cap, chapter 7 comes, and chapter 7 is kind of an interlude. And it's, it's the interlude before the breaking of the seventh seal. We see in chapter 7 that there are 144,000 Jewish converts. They're the greatest evangelists that have ever been known in the world. They are sealed by God to do his work. And there is worship of God by all of heaven. Remember that it says the myriad upon the myriads. You see all the people that were standing before the throne back up that we read about earlier in chapters 1, right? In chapter 4, and you see all of that picture, and all of them are before God, praising Him. Right? So it's a great picture. So seven is an interlude. It's almost like Jesus is saying, listen, I, this is what I'm getting ready to do. Even in the midst of all this destruction, I am going to be merciful. I am going to share my gospel even in the midst of all of this. So you look at all this destruction and you say, oh, Lord, this, this is awful. I don't know if I want to read this. But then in the midst of it, don't forget what Jesus is doing. He is showing great mercy, great love, great forbearance, great patience. And he's sending those to say, turn to Christ. Know the gospel. Right? So chapter 7 is kind of this interlude. And then we come to chapter 8. 
Chapter 8 is the breaking of the seventh seal. And all of heaven, remember, you remember, is quiet with amazement. I think John says that it's quiet for about 30 minutes. It's almost like they're, they're, they're thunderstruck about what's about to happen. Right? And the sounding of the first four trumpets occurs. And it brings this great ecological and economic disaster upon the earth. Remember that, you know, the earth is destroyed, the oceans are contaminated, all of a third of the shipping fleets are destroyed, the, the rivers are poisoned, and all of the heavens see this great shaking. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this picture of the seventh seal is getting, it's getting worse, it's getting terrible. Now, that kind of summarizes chapters one through eight, right? But one of the things we need to remember as Christians is that Satan has always, 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 always been seeking to destroy God's work. Think back to, to the fall in the Garden of Eden, right? He was the instrument that caused sin to enter into the world, right? He tempted Eve. Now, we read that story and you say, well, Eve was the one that did it. Uh, they're both there. They're both involved. They're both guilty before God. So don't miss that. But he was there. Then you, you see the Nephilim. They're in Genesis 6. It's, it's these angels that come to mate with women. And they're to disrupt the, the redemption plan. Right? You think about what, what, it, what happened in Genesis 3.15. God says, I will send the seed to destroy you, Satan. To crush your head. And so what does Satan try to do? He just tries to destroy that lineage right from the very beginning. And they are destroyed in the great flood, right? In Genesis 7. Remember, he accused and tested Job. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And Satan continuously accuses the redeemed before God. He continuously does that. Did you know that he stands before God and accuses you? before God, and you before God, and me before God. Oh, look at that Linda Griffin. You know, she, you know, she does this and does that. Oh, you know, no wonder she, she doesn't turn from away from you, because you don't really deal with her too much. He accuses all the time, all the time. It is so destructive, right? He continuously attacks Israel. If you, if you just do a cursory reading of the Old Testament, what do you see? Time and time and time and time again, the people of Israel are literally destroyed over and over and over and over again. Right? We saw the temptation of Christ in Matthew 4. Remember that great story? And how did Jesus always respond to him? It is written, right? Satan twists God's word, but Jesus comes back and says, it is written. And he even tries to destroy the inner circle of the disciples with Judas. Can you imagine having a guy like that hanging around? What it must have been like? You know, Edna had to be tough. Um, but he tries to do that through that. And then he had attempts to destroy the early church. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that? They lied. Right? Slain in the spirit. Slain in the spirit. Literally. Right? Um, and then Paul had his thorns in the flesh. Right? So Satan has continually tried to destroy God's work on earth. We should not be surprised at it. Now think about your own lives. Think, think about as you think about the time from the time you came to know Christ till today. Where have you seen Satan try to just hammer you? He seems to know our weak spots, doesn't he? He really does. He knows our weak spots, every one of us. You know, I hope I'm not telling, speaking out of school, but Steve said to me a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, Pastor, man, I, I've only known Jesus for a couple of years. This living for Jesus, this is hard work. I said, yeah, brother, it is. Amen. 
Amen. It is hard work. Because Satan is always going after us because we are his enemy. Right? When we're in his camp, he can let us be. I don't know if you guys have ever read uh, C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letter. Have you guys ever read that? If you have not read it, get it. The screw tape letters. I only read parts of it. But boy, you guys ought to get that. That is a classic. It is about a senior devil coaching a junior devil on how to destroy a Christian. It's it is brilliant. But it's the same thing. Do they? Yes, once a year. He hasn't come yet. Yeah, it was usually during the Christmas. When when it comes up, let us know. Tell us. Yeah. Not like you'll see it. Go with a class. Go with a class. So let's not be surprised that Satan has attempted to destroy God's work. We see it in His Word, God's Word. We see it in our lives, right? We, we do. Now in Revelations nine. God, however, now uses Satan's hatred for God and his works to enact his final judgment on unbelieving mankind. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, that's a big... Theologically, what I just said is there's a lot there. All right? God works all things together for good for those who know him, who've been called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. So, God is using Satan as an instrument to enact his judgment upon the world. It's a, it's a difficult thing. Right? Let's not sugarcoat it. Right? But let's look at verses 1 through 12 because they reveal the fifth trumpet that releases the demons upon the earth. And they are described as demons that torment mankind who are not marked with God's seal. And the, and the torment only lasts for five months. But you'll see as we read the text that that torment is something that is unbelievable. It is utterly something that mankind has never seen, never felt, never had to deal with. It's awful. And then verses 13 through 21, which we will study the first Wednesday after the new year. We're, we're going to take off next week. But that, those verses describe an untold slaughter of mankind at the, at the sixth trumpet sound. Right? And there are three plagues that are going to be released upon the earth by four angels at the sixth trumpet that are just devastating for the world. And what you will see is, if you think back to the third seal, remember that, where death comes? How many, how many, much of the world was killed back then? Third. 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 And verses 13 through 21, another 25% is killed. I, I went home last week from here and a thought hit me about chapter 8 that um, all these different plagues and all these things that were going on, it reminded me of uh, the book of John that talks about when Jesus says, I am the vine, and that God will, you know, he cuts the branches that bear no fruit. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it made me think that all of this is happening is to prune the earth, yeah. basically. It's like God is saying, well, the gardener's here. Yep. And I'm going to prune this baby yep. and make it new again. Yep. And, but the pruning hurts. It hurts. Yeah, it's something that we... The picture of pruning here is is awful. There's, there's no way to get around it. Mm -hmm. right? um, but you're exactly right. There, there's this great pruning, this great segmenting out. All right? So let's look at... Chapter, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Let's read those, and then we'll start looking at some of the verses here. Uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. And he opened the bottomless pits. 
And smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air was darkened by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth. And power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. And they will long to die, and death flees from them. And the appearance of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sounds of their wings was like the sounds of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. And they had tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek his name is Apollonon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Wow. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a Christmas week text, is it? I don't think you'd see this preached on Christmas week. Right? But let, let's try to understand what's going on here. There's a lot of symbolism here. Okay? So let's try to try to work our way through it. Now the fifth angel, he sounds his trumpet and a star falls to earth. Now a lot of people have a lot of claims who this is, but it's most likely it's Satan that's fallen to earth. Isaiah 14 Chapters 12 through 15 describe the fall of Satan to earth. Right? And note that in Revelation 9, verses 1 through 2, this is not Satan's original rebel rebellion where he was cast to earth. This is not the original thing. Satan has access to God's presence where he constantly accuses the saints. So the picture here is that Satan is now ultimately being thrown out of heaven where he can no longer accuse the saints before God. Okay, so now he's he's on our plane. He's on our plane. So before that he was in heaven? He can go back and down? Really? Oh, so he's totally thrown out. I thought he was just on our plane pretty much. He can go back and forth, right? Now this scene is the permanent <laughs> casting of Satan to earth just prior to his final judgment. He no longer has access to accuse the saints. The battleground, in other words, is now just moved to the earth. Right? And, and it's really due to the, the war with the archangels that's described in, in Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. We'll get there in a couple of weeks. But you get the scene that now Satan has been booted out of heaven, the access to heaven, and now he's here permanently. It's a scary thought scary thought, right? He's active on earth now, right? Mm -hmm. But now, this, this is a, a desperate picture. Now, Satan understands that his time is running out, so what does he do? He marshals all of his resources against mankind. Notice that this thing called the bottomless pit. It's the pit of the abyss. And um, this phrase, bottomless, it, it appears seven times in Revelation. And it's always, it's always associated with the, the abode of incarcerated demons. <coughs> Satan and his hordes will be locked away in the bottomless pit during the millennium. Okay? In Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says that the pit is the place reserved for demons awaiting punishment. Mm. And Peter uses an interesting word in, in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. He calls it Tartarus. It's a Greek term used in Greek mythology for the place 
that had the worst, the most vile, the most wicked, the worst of all sinners. So the picture here is that these demons that are in this pit, these are the worst of the worst. Will there be any other demons on earth in the millennium? In the millennium? Not during the millennium. So no. they'll, it'll be totally free of any free kind of, of Free of that, yeah. 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 They'll be placed back in this pit until the final day of judgment. So you get this picture here that what's about to come is the worst of the worst. Now, I, how many of you read, have read um, the trilogy of... Um, Matthew? No, of... Um, oh. Dante's, Dante's Inferno, the trilogy. Have, have you ever read that? If you haven't read that, that's another one you need to read. You, you need to read all three of them, though. Uh, all three of them. It's a, it's a three-book series, right? Um, but the picture that you have here is that these, these demons are just awful. And in Dante's Inferno, what you see a lot of times is the demons also fight against each other. So can you imagine what's happened? These demons have been in this, this pit for eons. What do you think's been going on in that pit for eons? They've been fighting each other. They're ready to get out. Right? So it's, it's a difficult picture. In Jude 6 and 7, it also describes them as the most vile of all creatures. It's referring back to Sodom and Gomorrah. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, it refers to the demons as those disobedient during the days of Noah, probably referring to the Nephilim. It goes all the way back that they came to mate with women to destroy the lineage of the Messiah. And then Luke 8, 31 reveals that the demons hated the pit for its torture and its isolation. So you, you, get, a, you get a picture that this pit is not a place to be, right? Yeah. And when I, when I read this stuff, you know who I think of in this class? I think of Kay, and I think of George because they're artistic, and I can only imagine what's running through their heads. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> what? You know, there is a book I read in this present darkness. I don't know if you're yeah. 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 And they describe demons how they are, and, and they're, you know, the smoke, the, yeah. the green smoke, the yellow breeze. smoke, and stuff like that. So. Obviously, what they're describing here in Revelation is the spirit world. The people won't see them, but they will feel their yeah. sting. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 The book he just talked about, this present darkness, it does it covers some of the same things you just explained about Dante's Inferno. Yeah. Um, but it, ever since it's total fiction, but ever since I read that book, I have had a whole different concept mm -hmm. of the power of demons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a it's a it's an ugly picture, mm -hmm. right? It's a really ugly picture. <clears throat> now, notice that the key to the bottomless pit is given to Satan, mm -hmm. probably by Christ Himself. Mm -hmm. And you have smoke rising up from the pit. It's a picture of judgment. And, and you notice that the image of the sun and the air they're darkened. And it's one of untold wickedness that is about to be released upon the earth. Pastor Joe, why would he be given the key? Yeah, yeah I mean, because he the key is, lets you is, in and out. He, he is opening the door because he <coughs> is being, remember what Christ is doing. He's using Satan as the instrument to exact his judgment upon the world. Right, but when he gives Satan the key, Satan is not bound to being in that pit during that time if he's got right. the key. Right. He's okay. not in there. Yeah. Well, this is where I feel like, isn't this where Satan has complete and total full reign on the earth? Yep. Because he doesn't have it now, even though he right. does do a lot of damage. But this is where... The Holy Spirit is here. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is here. Yeah, but there's a picture here that Satan now is running free and rampant. And his armies are doing the same. The rest how, the but how can he right be now. in the presence of God? Because... Aren't you supposed to be holy in the presence of God? Like, like you know, on in heaven, and he's not. Yeah, he's read not. Job. So how, is, how can he be there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Job, it describes where Satan is always is talking to God. Mm -hmm. And even when he was kicked out, I mean, he still has 
goes back and forth, and yeah. then Job describes that. Yeah. But um, you see that as God's grace, that even no matter how bad we find ourselves, He still gives us access mm -hmm. to yeah. Him, to because it, it, it shows us that God is just like how He has given us the opportunity to come you know, to accept Christ's um, death is the same thing, but Satan just has that non-redeeming yeah. uh, qualities, but it shows us, in, because when I read it in Job, that was one of the things as a younger believer, I thought, oh, I mean, how can God even have it? But then I realized that is just God showing us that no matter what, even with our unredeem if we feel we have unredeemable qualities, he still gives us the access to come to him, you know, to receive Amen. what he has really given. So it's given almost like he's giving him another to, yeah. like a chance to try to And that we'll have no excuse, just yeah. like the devil has no excuse. Well on that on that time that he releases uh, Satan, that's during the last forty two months or the Great Tribulation. And and that's really God's, because he doesn't have access to heaven, God is actually doing this as the final judgment against Satan. Because mm -hmm. even when he uses a tool against someone else, oftentimes he still acts judgment on that person. And we saw that in the history of the Bible, back and forth. Whenever he would bring someone uh, to punish Israel, they didn't escape. Yeah. They got punished yeah, they in got the process. Punished. And this will be the final punishment for Satan, and it'll be really bad. And but the Jewish people who have been marked, sealed. they're they're sealed and they're more or less protected during this time. But there will be a lot of martyrs yeah. that are really bad because I, I think the Antichrist doesn't become full blown until that. So let, let's let's keep going because we're not going to make it if we don't keep going. <laughs> All right. Verses three through through six, it says, "And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone." But the torment for five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it, and they will long to die, and death flees from death. Wow. So the image here is that now the power is unleashed. Satan's power is unleashed, and John reveals there's this imagery of the demons almost like a horde of locusts. Now, how many have any of you ever seen a horde of locusts? Yeah. They're uncountable. Have you? Yeah. It's uncountable. Right? When I was a boy growing up in northeast Texas, I've seen it once and it was amazing. There there were millions, I think, of those things. And and the picture here is the same one. They're uncountable and their destruction will be untold. A horde of locusts, when it, it when it arrives, they eat everything. There's nothing left, right down to the ground. Right? Same picture. Um, now, some have proclaimed that these locusts are actual locusts. Probably not the case, right? Um, because there's this imagery of them being combined with the scorpion. One, right? They emerge from the bottomless pit. So that's a place that's only reserved for Satan and his demons. And they do not hurt the, uh, hurt the vegetation on the earth. So these, these seem to be demons. And John is doing his best to describe what he's seeing. Right? Now, the men that have the seal of God is 144,000, correct? The rest of God's people that are still alive at that point will not have the seal of God. Okay. And they'll be martyred. Right. Yes, there will be a lot of martyrs during this time. Yeah, a lot. So, those that are tormented are without the seal of God. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. The imagery is that God will protect 
the 144,000 just like he protected the Israelites during the plague. Remember that? All those? The ten plagues in Egypt? Um, remember that God promises to protect his church in Revelation 3.10. If you go back and look at that, what did he say? He says, you will not face what is about to occur. Yes. Right? God also proclaims the same scene in Ezekiel 9, verses 4 through 6, that he will protect his people, but bring judgment on all others. Mm -hmm. Now notice that the time period is also short. It's only five months. But it's a period of, of apparently intense physical and spiritual punishment. People will desire to die. They will seek death, but it will not come. But that's part of what I was confused about before. This says he will protect his people, but bring judgment on the rest. I'm asking about his people that have committed to him, but are still living. Um, he will protect those people. Yeah, he will protect. <coughs> so not just 144,000 with the seal. Anybody okay. that has the seal of God on their head. Right? Now, in verses 7 through 10, we get the image of the demon. Now notice... Poor John, I, I can't imagine what he's, he's seen. And he's struggling to try to describe what he's seen. So he uses the word like ten times in this text. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've seen something totally new to your life experience. And, and what do you do? You, you use other things that you're familiar with to describe what you've just seen or experienced. John is doing the same thing. So he says they're like horses prepared for battle. The picture is that they're powerful, they're straining, they're, they're all lathered up. If you've ever ridden a horse that is all lathered up and ready to go, the power underneath you is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. The same picture here, they're ready to charge. Then they say they have crowns like gold. Now they're wearing what's called a stephanoi, a crown of victory, right? And it implies that they are unstoppable, that they will be, be, be victorious over all that do not have the mark of God. No one will be exempt. They will be unstoppable. They have places like men. So they're intelligent, they're cunning, they're deceiving. They have hair like women. They're alluring. But they're dangerous. <laughs> right? Yeah. Amen, brothers? Yep. They have teeth like lions. They're powerful. They're tearing. They're destructive creatures. They have breastplates of iron. They are protected from harm and they are unstoppable. And then the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots. They are literally rushing to destroy everything before them. So the picture is, is that the, these, these are the worst of the worst, but not only are they the worst of the worst, but they can't wait to enact their judgment upon the world. It's an awful picture. And their, their mission is singular. It is to hurt mankind. That is their mission. Now, it's only for five months, but then they're going to be returned back to the abyss with Satan by God in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. So Satan, has, he can't use his key at this point. Right. They take the key right. away. They take the key away. Uh -huh. Right? All right, so picture. Everybody okay with the picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, look at 11, verses 11 and 12. It says, They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name is in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollonon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Now, some people say that this leader is Satan, but the angel of the, the abyss it seems to be that this is another very powerful anger underneath Satan's command. Right? Um, Satan's domain is in the heavenlies. He's associated. He's not associated with the abyss until Revelations 20. So this, this thing...
comes up out of the abyss with all these other demons. In fact, Satan is called the prince of the air. Remember that? Right? In Ephesians 2.2. 2. Now, in Greek and Hebrew, the words mean the same. They literally mean destroyer. So this is the chief destroyer of all the destroyers. Right? He is the king of them all. He is the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. And the Old Testament calls this word Abaddon as the place of eternal punishment. This is the baddest dude in the prison. Mm. The right? Satan isn't in the pit with all the demons. Mm. He, what's he doing? Just flying around? Flying around. Taking but, he's by, but he's by himself, right? He's all of his demons mm. in the pit. Yeah. Not all of them. It's no, there are some others. No, yeah. so but this is the worst of the worst. The What's that? It says that they're returned to the abyss with Satan. In Revelation 20. Yeah. Oh, in 20. But her question was have... prior to that. Okay. So here are the questions tonight. Satan has always been trying to destroy God's work on earth. How are you seeing this fact played out today? And what is your role in standing against Satan's work? Thank you, guys. I don't know about I don't know about you, but I feel like the weeds are being cut down. Mm -hmm. The bushes are being cut down. The field is totally blank. There is no room to hide anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? So how are you seeing all of this play out? Right? I mean, what I see in our government is awful. <laughs> yeah. It's awful. Yeah. Right? You know, and as Christians, how do we stand up to that? Right? in the midst of all that's going on. So think about that, right? Um, this text reveals that God uses the force of evil to enact his plan for the end of the world. How does this text reveal God's sovereignty over all? And then finally, read Romans 8, 28 through 30. Why, why can you take comfort in God's plan even when it looks crazy, even when it looks uncertain, even when you say, doesn't make any sense. Right? So this, this is not a cheery chapter. Right? But it's a good chapter. It, it's a good thing to make us think. Right? Um, so what, we've only got about 15 or 20